Welcome to the new course, Develop Your Counterintuitive Thinking. For this course, I decided to do something slightly different than uh, what I did in the previous courses. Uh, so, previously, I have uh, made courses on calculation and um, play in closed positions. And in both of these courses, um, I tried to lay out some uh, principles and ideas how to play in certain types of positions. Uh, but the difference in this course will be that uh, rather than looking at uh, the principles uh, and rules that one should follow in certain positions, uh, we will actually look at exceptions from the rules. We will look at uh, solutions to uh, problems in certain situations uh, which are not standard, which are, uh, as we say, counterintuitive. And I believe that um, this area uh, of chess has not been explored enough uh, and I hope that um, this will be a good contribution to this topic. Uh, now it's true that uh, we don't get such situations uh, so often. Usually indeed if we follow the standard rules and procedures in chess uh, we get uh, good results. But there are also positions where the answer to the most important question in chess, what is the best move? in the position um, cannot be um, uh, achieved by just looking at um, or considering what is the usual, what is the norm. We have to actually think uh, sometimes outside of the box and um, uh, in that, that way we can uh, explore the position better and find better solutions than we would if we just uh, followed the, the standard uh, rules. Uh, so, in the course we will cover many areas. Uh, we will cover opening, middle game, positional play, tactical play, end games. And in all of these different scenarios we will try to see uh, situations where uh, we can uh, use this kind of uh, non-standard counterintuitive thinking uh, in a good and positive way. Uh, so, we will look at situations where uh, there is maybe a more natural alternative uh, to this counterintuitive move. Uh, we will look at situations where one cannot find this kind of move uh, without creative thinking, uh, where maybe this idea seems uh, uh, too risky or even outrageous to play, uh, even though you see the idea. Uh, so we'll look at all these kinds of um, uh, positions, and um, I decided to break down uh, the course in nine parts uh, to make it easier to cover all of these different scenarios. Uh, and I also want to, in this short introduction, I want to uh, show you sort of a preview of what we will cover uh, throughout the course. Uh, so we'll go topic by topic, chapter by chapter, and uh, that way you will have a better idea of uh, what we will look at. So the first chapter so this will be the second video in the course, will be on uh, counterintuitive ideas in the opening. And uh, I will just show one example from uh, this chapter. We have uh, here on the board the position from the game Vitugov against Caruana. Uh, you may already have seen this game. Uh, this, it was quite a famous game, uh, played I think um, in 2019, in which Caruana launched uh, with black pieces launched uh, a fantastic novelty that uh, runs against all uh, opening principles. In this position, which by the way was played in hundreds of games by strong players and amateurs alike, um, Caruana played the move Queen d7. And this move simply on the first glance makes no sense uh, because uh, we, we surely had better developing moves than uh, playing with the queen. The queen also uh, is in the way of the bishop, so the question is how are we going to develop the light square bishop if we put the queen there? Uh, and also what is the queen doing on d7 anyway? But despite this looking uh, totally silly, this is actually a very strong move, and we will explain in the first chapter why this is so and how Caruana came up with this idea in the first place. And in fact, Caruana did win this uh, important game. So this will be the first chapter. 
counterintuitive thinking in the opening. The second chapter is uh, conditioned reflex. This is actually something that I think is at the root of uh, many, uh, I guess, at the root of uh, the way we think usually about chess. We have these reflexes. We we automatically want to make certain decisions because we know that in, let's say, 95% of cases, they are um, indeed the best uh, decisions. So, for instance, in this position, which was played incidentally also in the game of Vitugov, Vitugov VE, uh, black plays the move bishop takes f1. And how would you recapture on f1? Automatic reflex is to recapture with a king, of course. And this is what Vitukov did. But actually, taking with the king leads to almost losing position for white. And surprisingly, the best move in the position is not um, a king takes f1, but rook takes f1. Uh, which is, of course, quite counterintuitive. Uh, so we will take a look at this in the course. This will be one of the positions that we will cover in this chapter on conditioned reflexes, on uh, our urge to play a move based on something that we already know uh, from before. The third chapter will be unusual piece maneuvers. So um, here we have one example from the chapter, from the game between Grandmasters Oparin and Kobalia. And here it is white to move. Uh, and white has some uh, quite uh, natural ways to deal with this bishop g5. Um, uh, of, uh, offer to exchange the bishops. For example, taking on g5 or playing e3 come to mind. Um, perhaps some other move. But in fact, the best move in the position and the one that was played by Oparin is very surprisingly bishop c1. Uh, such backward moves are very difficult to find. But we will uh, explore uh, this example a bit uh, more in the third chapter and we'll see how Oparin came up with this idea and uh, how it helped him get an advantage into position. So this was uh, chapter 3. Let's look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 is very interesting. One of my favorite topics and I also believe that it's quite exciting for um, almost anyone to, to explore this. Uh, the Brave King. So uh, when the king becomes uh, an active piece in in the middle game, especially. Uh, so here we have the game, uh, or a position from the game Lenderman Garev from US Championship uh, a few years ago, where Lenderman with white sacrificed a piece on g7 uh, in order to expose uh, black king and also uh, prepare this e5 uh, where uh, the pin indeed looks very scary for black. And in this position, black has uh, several ways to uh, try to defend against this. But the one that uh, Garev chose is uh, absolutely stunning. Uh, so here, he played the move king g6, uh, which at first just looks crazy. Uh, because you're putting your... Uh, white wants to play e5, and you're putting your king on the same di diagonal with the queen. Uh, it's even more exposed than before. And still, this move is quite good. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best move in the position, but it's actually a good move. And uh, the point is, just to quickly show, in case of e5, black has this bishop f5 with the uh, attack on white queen. Uh, but that's not the end of the story, and we will uh, explore uh, this uh, in more detail in chapter 4. Uh, let's look at um, chapter 5. Here we will um, look at a more positional topic. Uh, the topic in chapter 5 is our counterintuitive peace exchanges. And this is a position from the game uh, Anand Grishuk, in which um, Anand with white pieces, having a slight uh, space advantage here, makes a somewhat counterintuitive exchange of the strong uh, bishop on f6 for the knight that doesn't seem that, that strong. Uh, but we will see how this exchange allowed Anand to put uh, positional pressure on Grishuk and uh, basically leave him without any counterplay and later win the game as well. Uh, our next topic will be in Chapter 6, um, counterintuitive tactical decisions. So 
this will be in co complete um, opposition with the previous uh, chapter where we will look at the more positional uh, scenarios here we will look at tactical positions where you need to make a, a very concrete decision and here uh, in this position where it is black to move um, he has a space advantage and uh, his pieces look uh, much better than white pieces but how to make the most of them well quite surprisingly here the best move is the spawn sacrifice with e4 and uh, if black doesn't play this move then his advantage is, is just minimal but when he plays this move uh, everything opens up for him uh, his pieces become uh, much more uh, dangerous for white uh, he gets this e5 outpost he opens up his bishop and so we will cover uh, this and, and similar uh, tactical decisions in uh, chapter 6 uh, moving on to chapter 7 uh, here we will look at um, a very interesting topic a positional one uh, counterintuitive decisions uh, regarding the pawn structure and one of the examples that we will look at here uh, is from the game Predorozhny Yakovenko where Grandmaster Yakovenko in this position continued like this knight f6 and after the move d5 attacking the queen he played a very counterintuitive move queen b5 allowing white to triple his pawns but actually this was a great uh, decision because uh, this allowed uh, black to exert uh, uh, pressure on both a file and uh, the c file uh, so in this particular case tripling your pawns is actually uh, better than having uh, pawns on c7 and a7 and we will take a look at this interesting example and more in chapter 7. Uh, chapter 8. Uh, this will be just violating uh, some general uh, positional principles. And when I say violating, of course, this has to be taken with a grain of salt. When you violate uh, or when you play against a certain principle, uh, like in this case, uh, Kramnik with white played the move b4 burying his bishop on a5 uh, it may seem for the rest of the game uh, you're actually uh, following another principle and this will be one of the main uh, uh, points in, in the course uh, when you're making a counterintuitive decision uh, it's it's often uh, some obvious principle that you're violating but actually you are following some uh, sort of a hidden idea or principle that that actually makes this decision uh, a good one uh, so in this case what did white do with b4 well he stopped uh, black's main uh, c5 break and uh, that way black pieces remain uh, caged in uh, just as the bishop is on a5 but uh, for example the rook on a7 is, is a more valuable piece than the bishop and uh, finally uh, our last topic will be counterintuitive decisions in end games so, for instance, uh, we have this uh, endgame with rook against bishop, which looks to be winning for white. Uh, and in, indeed, if black plays something like king e6, uh, white will uh, bring his king over to d4, uh, push the king back, and it should be winning. Uh, but here, uh, black can fight for a draw um, for a very long time if he plays f4, if he actually gives up the pawn. And uh, this is not something that comes to your mind immediately. Uh, but the point here is that uh, by sacrificing the pawn, he can actually create counterplay uh, against the h, white h pawn. So he gets this f5 square for the king in case that uh, white starts uh, moving his rook uh, uh, from the fifth rank. And this position, I'm not sure if it's theoretically drawn or not. I've seen that in practice, black has uh, rarely managed to hold this endgame. But with precise defense, it might be quite difficult for white to actually break uh, this position, precisely because of this king f5 counterplay. Uh, so this is generally the, the content of um, our course. Uh, I hope that it will be entertaining for you as well as uh, instructive and, and helpful. Uh, so 
even if you don't get some uh, concrete ideas, which I really doubt, I think you, you, will, you will learn something new and you will learn to think in, in a more creative way. Uh, this should at least uh, be interesting because I will show some uh, really nice uh, examples in the course. Uh, so with that said, uh, I hope to see you next week.